Okay, well, welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Jenny McFarlane. Um, I'm the bird conservation biologist for the Tucson Audubon Society. I do have Olia Weekly as um, sort of an invisible co-host on this meeting as well. And uh, Olia also works for Tucson Audubon in the conservation department and uh, is also here. So she'll be monitoring the chat and letting uh, any joiners in on this meeting. So thank you, Olya, for your help with that. And okay, so I do have everyone muted to start with, but if you do need to ask a question, please go ahead and um, unmute yourself to, to ask me a question. But I will save quite a lot of time at the end for questions as well. So then we'll probably just unmute everybody for the, for the end. But if you have something really important to ask while I'm going, please do feel free to jump in. So, um, so this is the volunteer surveyor meeting for the 2023 winter grassland surveys for the Arizona Important Bird Areas program. So we do these surveys uh, every winter and the last several years we've started doing them in January and February, uh, sort of the beginning of the year, which makes it a lot easier to keep track of the data than when we would do it from like December and January. We're straddling those two years, but now we've, we've been doing them January and February and that's been working really well. So these are the 2023 surveys. And we're focusing on um, two really important patches of Chihuahuan desert grassland, which is a really important habitat in Southeast Arizona. And it also extends into Southwest New Mexico, a little bit into West Texas as well, and is mostly in Mexico, which is why it's termed Chihuahuan desert grassland. Quite a lot of this habitat type is actually in Chihuahua as well as Sonora. So this is a really important habitat type for wintering species, uh, for lots of breeding species too. You get some monsoon breeders as well in the spring and summer. But in the winter, a lot of the birds that nest in the tall grass prairie in the northern part of the United States, so in like Dakotas and uh, you know Montana, um, southern Canada, a lot of the species like Sprague's pipits that breed in those habitats tend to winter as a group down in these Chihuahuan desert grasslands, which um, La Cienegas in uh, near Sonoida, as well as the uh, San Rafael grasslands near Patagonia are two really good examples of this habitat type. So we'll talk a little bit more about the species we may encounter and our priority species, the chestnut collar long spur, and why they're important towards the end. But uh, for, for this meeting, I'd like to structure it so that the beginning focuses on the logistics that everybody needs to know for the surveys, the first round of the 2023 winter grassland surveys that are coming up this week. So um, tomorrow is going to be the Las Cienegas survey. So that's Wednesday. I have all my little organizing tabs up here. That's Wednesday, January 4th will be the Las Cienegas survey. And then Friday, January 6th will be the San Rafael survey. So this is the first round of surveys. And um, I always, I try to pair them like this. So we do in January, we do a round of La Cienegas and San Rafael together. And then later in February, we do another round. We repeat the surveys sort of approximately a month apart. And it's the same thing where it's San Rafael and La Cienegas in the same week so that we can compare that data and see if the birds are moving around. Uh, and we have had um, in past winters, pretty interesting differences between those two survey rounds. So that's that's why we do it that way. So this this cert meeting is for the first round. We will do another meeting for the second round. So um, we may have different people for those surveys and we may update the protocol or whatever. So, all right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And the first thing I wanted to, and this was also emailed out, but I also just want to cover it briefly is where we're meeting and when. So for the Wednesday survey, for Las Cienegas, we will be meeting at 7.30 at the Empire Ranch House. So the info email I sent out did have a map link to the Empire Ranch House, but it's pretty easy to find. It's on the north end of Las Cienegas. When you're uh, coming off of from Highway 83, there is a, a brown sign saying where to turn for the, the Empire Ranch House or Empire Ranch. So if you turn down there, go down that paved road towards the big ranch house, there's a, a parking lot, a pretty large dirt parking lot. There are restrooms available there, like sort of pit toilet restrooms. Uh, so we'll be starting out there, meeting there as a group and sort of organizing ourselves into our teams and then, then heading out for our survey. And then for Friday, the San Rafael survey, we'll, we'll be meeting at 7 a.m. at Gathering Grounds, uh, like coffee shop, cafe in Patagonia. They do open at seven, so they should be open. 
and they have a restroom there. And there's also public restrooms in Patagonia at the south end of the park as well. But so there are restrooms available at both these meeting locations. And uh, Gathering Grounds also has the bonus of having coffee available and breakfast things. So we'll be meeting at 7 a.m. there. The San Rafael surveys do tend to take a little bit longer than the La Cienega surveys. So we'll probably be out into the early afternoon for San Rafael. La Cienega, we tend, we often wrap, wrap up around noon, but it, some teams do tend to be out later, especially if they're finding lots of long spurs. So I would plan to wrap up around you know, anywhere between 12 and two. Los San Rafael can go a bit longer if the birding's really fun and really good. And it is a bit of a longer drive from the meeting location um, for San Rafael to the actual survey areas. So San Rafael does tend to go a bit later in the day, but uh, Los Angeles tends to wrap up around 12-ish. So just, just FYI. And if a team does finish up earlier, I will have drop-off box available for both surveys. For Las Cienegas, it'll be at the ranch house. I usually kind of hide it where the place where we park and there's like a, a four, like a cement four steps up <laughs> towards a sort of open shed where people often will, will, when they're birding, will eat lunch in there. It's kind of an open shed area. Uh, I usually put the box right around there with a label on it saying it's a bird survey drop-off box. And then for the San Rafael survey, I'll put it at Patton before we head out. So that way we're not holding people up waiting for other teams to show up to, to leave their, their data. Um, just to sort of make sure we accommodate everybody. In terms of what to bring for the survey, everyone should dress in layers. It starts off quite cold in the morning and then it warms up dramatically. It's not unusual for us to start the survey all bundled up with many layers and then ending in t-shirts. It's not, it's not unusual. So definitely be ready to handle both the cold and it being quite warm at the end, um, you know, nice and pleasant and warm at the end. Definitely wear sturdy shoes. I recommend gaiters if you have them, those things that cover the tops of your boots and the bottom of your pants, if you have them, because um, we do often encounter, because we'll be walking through grassy areas, getting grass seeds into your socks and things. So if you have gaiters, this is the time to break them out. Uh, if you don't, it's, it's also fine, but you probably will get some grass seeds in your socks. Um, uh, wear sturdy boots. I would definitely bring hats, sunglasses. It can get quite bright, especially later in the morning. Uh, drinks, snacks, bring a lunch. I would recommend you bring a, you know, a small lunch if you'd like, or, or lots of snacks, whatever's best for you. And um, I have one other thing. I want to say. So yeah, so just sort of make sure you're ready to spend sort of all morning and a little bit into the early afternoon out in the field. So just bring anything you need with that sunscreen, any sort of protection like that. So uh, definitely binoculars and scope if you have one. You don't have to have a scope to do these surveys. It's not required or anything, but but they're they're fun out in this open expanses. And if you have a scope and you don't use it that often, this is a great chance to break it out and use it because you might see cool raptors sitting off at a distance, that sort of thing. So definitely a good chance to break out a scope. Okay, so those are the the logistics of where and when. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, let me pull this up first. All right, so screen two, here we go. All right, so um, Olya, can you see that okay? Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, so for the last Cienega survey, which is tomorrow, um, I do have this all organized on people with their team. So how I've done this from vast experience in the past, um, We've done these surveys for over 10 years, which I'll talk about in a bit, and they have evolved over time dramatically and in a really good way. And we used to just do a document, but just before things like Google Docs existed, and email them to everybody. And then when we made changes, we had to email new versions. It was a total, it, it became very confusing very fast. So what I do now is I do these online documents that um, only only I have access to changes. So don't worry, if you look at it, you're not, you're not able to change it. You can just see it. So, so um you can copy and paste and stuff from it. So I've organized these into teams. Now, I only have La Cienegas ready at the moment. I'm working on San Rafael and that will also appear. Oh, those are old. Oh, I thought I got rid of this. Okay, these are the old. This is not current for San Rafael. Shoot, go away. Okay, that's not accurate. Okay, but the La Cienegas information is accurate. Um, this is what I have here currently organizing teams. I really appreciate everyone filling out that online survey that really helped me figure out who to put where and, and what people's preferences were since we do have two types 
of teams. So um, I did send the link to this, but let me just scroll through it slowly so everyone can see it. But I do have everyone organized um, onto teams and we are doing what we're calling route teams as well as tank teams. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but this is all based on our new protocol and where that is, is um, what Zoom does, this makes it difficult to see my tabs. Here we go. Okay, no, stop it. All right, so, um, and rather than email that entire document, but if anyone would like that, let me know. I certainly can, I have, I have the document, but where you can find this document yourself, and this was sent in that, that first email, is if you go to our website, the Arizona IBA website, which is a program that's co-run by by Tucson Audubon as well as Audubon Southwest. So it's like a statewide program, which is why it has its own website. It's sort of like, you know, larger than Tucson Audubon. So if you go to aziba.org, that's the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program website. And these surveys are very much sort of a, a flagship survey of Arizona IBA program. You go to survey resources, although there it was on the slider. And you scroll down to the winter grassland, chestnut collared longspur surveys. This is where we have tons of links. So a lot of the links I've been emailing you guys are also here on this web page. So this is sort of an organizing page with all lots of info. I do have a video I made in, in the past on how to do these surveys. If you're into those sorts of videos shot with a camcorder out in Las Cienegas grassland, but um, which is really quite helpful. But the main thing I want to look at right now is so I have some background information here about the long spurs, which I think is kind of, kind of interesting because these really are a very imperiled species that we're monitoring. They're really a very interesting species where I have the winter grassland survey resource, the Arizona winter grassland survey protocol PDF. You can download that and I already have it open. So let me just open that. So here it is. So this is the PDF that downloads and this is our new protocol. This photo on the front, which you may recognize from behind me are chestnut colored long spurs. And this is quite a detailed protocol that we wrote. And what it's basically telling you is that there are types of survey. So the, the transect teams will be covering a section. And let me go back to the map. We'll be covering a section. Uh, oh, where did my map go? All right. So these are what the maps look like on my end. The Los Angeles map. Okay. So like that first team, which is covering two sections, will, so this is, and they're all labeled. So this is route four. The green one is Route 2A. The blue one is 2B. This has to do with the historic nature of these surveys because we've done them for over 10 years. The names have, we've split routes and things. So two used to be one, but now we split it into 2A and 2B. And this is one down here on the south end. And then two, uh, three, which is the Curly Horse Road area. So the transect teams will focus on sort of, you kind of move through your route and looking for long spurs, but that's sort of just, almost Christmas bird count style, casually looking for things as you go. You, your main job as a transect team is to do these transects and they are laid out very carefully on this, um, these uh, maps online, which uh, you can also access via your smartphone. I also have all these points in GPS Garmin units, which I will have one for each of those teams just to make sure if you need to, you have a Garmin unit if, if something happens with the smartphones to make sure that you can get onto these start and end points accurately. Because what they are is they're 200 meter long transects. And the protocol document goes into this in detail. But um, the basic idea is you get to your, um, you wanna do these east to west since it will be morning, it gets the, the sun out of your eyes. And you're gonna start at your first point and you're gonna walk a straight line to that second point. And they're only 200 meters, they're not super long but you wanna be really watching for any birds that you may flush, any sparrows, anything like that get recorded on your transect data sheets. And I will have all these data sheets organized for you guys, each in their own little folders. We did that last winter and it worked really well where each team gets their set of folders with blank data forms in there. And you just sort of pull out your transect folder when it's time to do a transect. When you, as you're moving through your route, you get to your transect and they're all named. So this is LCT2 Tran1. So, and you just record all the birds as you move through your transect. The reason we're using this new protocol, because back in the day, we did not do it like this at all. We just sort of Christmas bird count style roamed through our territories, documenting what we found, specifically looking for long spurs, but documenting everything. Um, this is part of a, a, an effort to join a larger bird survey effort that's happening 
internationally and within this entire region of the Chihuahua Desert grassland. It's being spearheaded from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. They do a much more, um, I don't know how to put it, much more involved protocol where they do sort of five of these in a row, these 200 meter long transects, they do five in a row and like five down. So it takes one person all morning to walk many transects. So what we've worked out with them is we'll do these fragmented transects, which fits within their data type. And so then our data contributes to this larger data set as supplemental data. So that's why we're doing it oriented exactly east-west. That's why they're exactly 200 meters. This is to fit within a larger survey effort because these birds, these Chihuahua desert grassland birds are really facing a lot of um, threats and a lot of these species are declining dramatically. And our data can help contribute to this larger effort. So that's why we're doing it this way. And this will be our third winter doing it with this new protocol. And I'm going to be meeting with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies at the end of this survey cycle to see how this is working and if we should modify it into the future. So just, just know that you're helping with a, a really large and involved bird survey process that, you know, this data is contributing to a larger data set as well as helping us monitor the long spurs in Southeast Arizona. So it's really a very kind of cool, I know it's seen, the first time we did it, it really seemed like a bit of a pain in the tuckus, but it's really um, quite helpful and, and contributes to a larger data set. So that's the idea of a transect. Now you're going to be looking for birds as you roam around as a transect team. But the main goal is to work on, to make sure you hit each of your transects. I do believe there's four per team area. I think it's four is what we did. Yeah, so it's like four. So we tried not to make it too much. So um, you have to kind of get right on the start there, but I tried to put them where they're pretty near roads, pretty easy to find, um, not too difficult to get to, but you are gonna be, and a lot of them work this way where they start kind of on the road and then they go exactly do west from that start point but that means you are crossing through grass so just you don't have to be like exactly on the line but try to be as close as you can say for safety you know at, while being safe and just really sort of you don't want to be rushing too fast but you don't want to you you don't want to go too super slow either so just sort of a normal careful birding pace will be will be fine um some of these transects are definitely <laughs> in areas that we get long spurs a lot over the years and some are in areas that we don't usually have them so it's really important that all of them get done so we can compare in a real time way um where the long spurs were and what exactly was happening in those 200 meters so this is to, to fit within that larger data set so that's the basic idea of transects which the protocol does talk about so it talks a little the first going through it talks about long spurs, which we'll talk about after, so, so that folks who have done these surveys before don't have to, to listen to all this. But um, so that's that first part here. So I have the, the protocol goes through the various steps. So each, every team, tank teams, as well as transect teams, will need to keep track of a general list of all the species they see during the morning. Now, the easiest way to do that, I think, is on eBird, like on your phone. If you don't want to do it that way, I do have a, a data sheet for that. If you'd like to just do an eBird list and then share that with us at the end, that also works great. So just sort of a, a list of your birding morning, kind of Christmas bird count style. Um, you can do multiple checklists if you like, but I do need sort of a, a summary, a trip summary or whatever on eBird or on the data form of all the birds you saw through the morning. So that's sort of a general checklist of all the species you had in, in approximate numbers um, for for your route, for your entire route, or if you're a tank team for the time you spent going between tanks and spending at tanks. Okay, so then another important document or a form that everyone needs to keep in mind is anytime you find long spurs, I do need a chestnut colored long spur occurrence form filled out. I have these forms at the end of the protocol, blank examples, but this is basically just a data sheet talking about, okay, I had long spurs. This is where they were. This really helps us make sure that we're, we're understanding everyone's data correctly. And even if you put those long spurs on your train, like you had them on a transect and they're on that transect sheet, you still need to do a long spur occurrence form. Um, and they're pretty simple. They're really easy to fill out. What I really need is, is where they were, coordinates, where they were, and a quick assessment of the grasses that are there uh, where you found long spurs. Or if they're if you're seeing them at a distance, sort of your best notion of what the grass is like where they occurred. 
So, and we'll, we'll talk about that at the end too, how to look at grasses. And there's a few grasses that tend to pop up over and over again. We do have a, a printed guide of these grasses. There's one in particular we're interested in, the non-native layman's love grass, which is luckily pretty distinctive from the other ones. And I have, we have a really good photo at the end of the protocol, but those grasses are really a, a key indicator, I think, of where the long spurs may be preferring to spend time since that is their main food source in the winter. So uh, anytime you find long spurs, I need one of these filled out. And it's a pretty quick fill out. If you are a team doing transects, I also going to assign a few of these cattle tank pond assessments. Uh, some of them have already been done in the last couple of years. So we're going to prioritize, prioritize certain ones. So I'll have a little list for you in the morning of just maybe one or two to do because you guys do have transects to do as well but you know do a couple of these tanks and pond assessments this is not staying there a long time it's just sort of assessing the tank which um uh, i'll talk about in a moment because i do have a good data sheet and example on this but this is just the idea that these tanks these ponds so in arizona people use the two interchangeably cattle tanks cattle ponds they're basically ponds dug into the ground usually sometimes they're metal tanks above that leak onto the ground but they're, they're usually dug out ponds that either have water pumped into them or they collect water from rainfall and they're there for the cattle but they're a really important resource for long spurs so you can see and many birds but you can see here this photo these long spurs are coming in to drink at the edge long spurs drink a lot of water during the day to digest the seeds that they're eating. So they come in quite frequently to these tanks and they're a really important resource. And so I have um, a tank assessment form, which is, has some pretty simple questions about, you know, how much vegetation's around the tank? Are there trees around the tank? Is the water looking clear and nice? Some of these things change year to year, not necessarily the amount of trees, but, but how the water looks, whether there even is water can change year to year. So that's why we do these assessments for the really tanks that seem really critical to the birds um, each winter so again it's not that I, I don't think it's very um it's not too much of a chore to fill this out and it's more making sure that each of these tanks just gets sort of looked at and we get a, a sense of what it's doing because then we can compare that to long spur use to try to figure out what makes a good tank for them. That's what we're really getting at there. So then we talked about the 200 meter transect survey segments. So these are walking a transect in one direction, looking at birds that you are seeing within, a, within um, what is it, 100 meters? Within 100 meters on either side of the line that you are walking. And, and I have real detailed information about how to do a transect here. Let's see here, da, da, da. and then, I do want to talk about um, tank watching teams real quick, and then we'll talk about grasses, and then we'll talk about how to tell if you're seeing long spurs, because that can be a really, um, really important part of this is knowing if you're seeing long spurs or not. Okay, so if you're on a tank watch team, you will be assigned specific tanks. So these are those, those cattle pond tank areas. You'll be assigned specific tanks uh, to go to and spend quite a bit of time watching. You will do a tank assessment form. So then the transect teams don't have to worry about that. You'll be doing a tank assessment form while you're there. So that's like getting a sense of, you know, how, how thick the vegetation is around the tank. And the protocol goes into that quite a lot, how to do a tank assessment. But you'll be doing a tank assessment, which is that tank assessment form. But then you're going to do a tank watch. And this is staying at a tank for a minimum of 45 minutes and recording when you have long spurs coming okay so if long spurs come in and, and, and the way long spurs move and and call at a tank is pretty darn distinctive and i do have a video that we'll we'll share at the end the way they come in is pretty darn distinctive they tend to come in as a group they call a lot they tend to call quite a lot and then they tend to sort of take turns they fly around as a flock at the edge of the tank and then they'll kind of take turns dropping down to drink while the rest are flying it seems almost like a visual cover for these birds to protect the ones that are drinking from things like falcons or you know aerial predators so long spurs always give the impression of being very skittish and nervous i don't know if they actually are but that's the impression that's kind of the, how you would call their behavior where they don't they very rarely all settle down to drink they're usually fluttering around and some are drinking taking turns and they're there usually for a while a few minutes doing this and if you stay very still um they, they may settle down a bit more 
but if there's cows walking around if they see you know a falcon nearby they're going to be a lot more skittish but anyway so anytime long spurs come to that tank and you can stay longer than 45 minutes if there's a lot of activity but a minimum of 45 minutes and even if so that if there's no activity you can go to the next tank but long spurs can take quite a while to come in uh just they just, they just come in when they're thirsty so that can take a little while but you're going to record not this is not the time you arrive and leave so this is a tank watch form you do a form a new form for each of the tanks that you watch as a tank watch team so you're gonna put the name the date and each of these tanks will have a name on the map uh the time and start of your presence being there as a team but these squares are for any time a group of long spurs come in and even if you think it's the same group we're still going to document this so let's say they come in at you know 705 and then they leave at 715 your approximate number whether that's an estimate or you know the number and you can tell me if that's an estimate or it could be an exact count and then any notes on their behavior while they're there now what can really what i have had happen at tanks that get a lot of activity is you'll have a group of maybe like looks like i don't know like 30 or 40 coming in and they come in and then a few minutes later a group that's clearly it seems like a different group like 10 will come in and then maybe a 30 40 comes in again in half an hour and that might you think maybe that's the same group and so that's what we're kind of getting at here we, we're trying to get at the idea of frequency on how often these birds are coming in and trying to get trying to guess from the data if they're different flocks or not now part of the reason we're doing this not to get too in the weeds is one these tanks seem to be an absolutely critical factor for the long spurs they really need these tanks they really seem to prefer certain tanks over others and another way we've been assessing this is putting out sound recorders so a lot of these tanks that are being assigned for the you as a tank watch team have sound recorders which gives us really good information on how frequently long spurs are coming in and it gives us no information on how many long spurs are coming in so this is very important data that's being collected by the tank watch teams that we can then later compare to sort of our assessment of the audio data coming out of sound recorders. So this is really pretty, pretty darn important information. I'm only sending people to tanks that are where we've had long spurs before, where I don't want people sort of, you know, feeling like they're wasting their time, but um, you are likely to see long spurs at these tanks. Okay, so it's definitely um, a fun job. It's an important job to be a tank team. And this is something we just added last winter and actually went really well. So it's not, actually, maybe I have a protocol. It's not in the written to the protocol, but that's what's going on with the tank watch form. And I do have a printed protocol to get you. And in fact, I'll follow up with all the tank teams after this meeting with that. But it's it's mostly about spending at least 45 minutes at your tank and assessing what's going on. So the sort of tanks that get watched are tanks, the right, you know, I assign teams to watch are tanks like this one so this is john's tank uh, it's accessed off of 82 you go through along the power line road you go through a gate that just has like a clip it's not it's not locked it's just a gate that's fastened shut you drive up this road and you go to a, a tank that's actually a very good tank that we over you know many different winters have had long spurs using so it's a really good tank and um it's tanks like that where I'm assigning people. Tanks where there's a, a pretty good likelihood that there could be long spurs. Although it definitely varies winter to winter. So we'll see. Okay. All right. So that is how the tank protocol is going to go. Tank watch protocol. And the next important thing to talk about is grasses. And, um, and I know grasses give people heartburn. And this is something I've talked about at great length. So with with other bird survey people is that birders i know grasses can seem intimidating but there's just a couple that were really that tend to occur a lot out there i'm not looking for any sort of super detailed grassland assessment and we'll probably be doing some sort of grassland plant work getting some people who are very skilled in plant id out to do this as well but what i'm really asking is are you seeing native or non-native grasses? That's really what's going on and, and how abundant are the non-native grasses. I really wish we had been doing this over the last you know 12 years of these surveys, because if we had, we may have had a much better insight into why places we used to get long spurs, we don't so much anymore, because I do think this is what's going on. So on the protocol, and this I'll have a printout of each of these for each team, you'll have this in the field to reference, uh, like a nice color printout is, this, this is the main grass that you really need to know right here. So this is layman's, layman lovegrass. It is a non-native grass. It is 
a grass that has been doing really well <laughs> in Las Cienegas, and it's doing really well these days also in San Rafael. It was introduced as a grass to um, prevent erosion, and it seems to do that really well, and it does seem to prefer areas that are disturbed, which is why it was introduced to prevent sort of soil erosion. So you tend to see it along roads, and you tend to see it in areas that have had a lot of soil impact. Now, this is what it looks like. It's, it's a really attractive grass. It's, it's kind of feathery in its appearance. This is what it looks like as a sort of a monoculture. And it does tend to do this. In areas where you get a lot of it, it has this quality of growing all the same height. Now, what that height is can vary year to year based on how much rain it's gotten, but they all tend to be the same height. And it's a very distinctive thing when you, when you as soon as you get used to seeing it. And there usually is some right around the ranch house. So we can look at that in person uh, tomorrow morning, if you'd like. But it's this, this is a good photo here showing it against the sky. It has this real sort of feathery um, appearance that's really very distinctive. Now, this is a grass that the birds will eat. So this gets talked about a lot. Oh, birds will eat layman's. And that does seem to be true. Native birds will eat layman's lovegrass. However, it is the bottom of their list. They don't like it. They really prefer the native grasses. And some scientists even argue that layman's has properties like what we think of as celery, that it takes, you know, what they say about celery, that it takes humans more calories to eat celery than you get from the celery. That seems to be what's going on with layman's. It is not good forage for any of these native birds, um, and especially with our emphasis on chestnut colored long spurs. Now, the rest of this document does have some other natives that we are focusing on. So amaranth's a good one to know. That's that real prickly one that you often find near water. And they're, they're labeled real nicely. And so when you see them and they feel like, oh yeah, that was in the, that was in the packet, you can, you'll have it in person. So you can sort of go to that packet. We do tend to see things like um, cane beer grass is one we do tend to see out in Los Angeles. And here's that, the layman's, boo, layman's. And then Russian thistle, which is also a non-native. So if you see that around, that tends to be also near water, more like near tanks, but the layman's can be kind of anywhere in the grassland. These are some natives, muleys. These are nice. And um, these nice descriptions too of, of kind of a quality of the plants. And bristle grass I have seen out at Los Angeles quite a lot. It's like Johnson grass, which is also non-native, but I don't see it that much at a Los Angeles. So we probably won't encounter it that much. But the ones that you really want to be on the lookout for are these grandmas. So grandma grasses are native, and these seem to be some of the favorite food of long spurs. So these grandmas, especially things like this curly blue grandma that looks, or this is what it looks like dried out, and this is what it looks like sort of fresh and green, but they have kind of this, this eyelash or eyebrow appearance. That's a real favorite with long spurs. And then oh, we see a lot of these side oats grandmas out there too in the grasslands. And if you see these grandmas, that's definitely something we want noted on those long spur occurrence forms or anywhere where you're going to be writing grasses. We definitely want these grandmas noted because, and, and the cane beer grasses tend to be around too. And then things like Sacaton is another native that's real abundant out in Los Cienegas. And it makes these big clumps, like big, like four feet across, really large clumps that uh, once you know the names of these, you realize you've been seeing these a lot as you bird in these grassland areas. And once you get a sense too of what layman's looks like, it gets to make a lot more sense where you'll be in an area where you're not finding a whole lot of birds when you're just out birding and grasslands. Like, Why are there any birds out here? This looks great. Like, oh shoot, it's all layman's. That's, that seems to be what's happening here on the north end of Los Angeles. So this is definitely a really important thing to know. And I think it'll also serve you well learning it as you move forward with your, with your birding, because it's just really pretty, pretty apparent once you know what you're looking for. All right, so then I do have at the end of the protocol examples of the blank data forms. I will have printouts of all of these for, you know, that are appropriate for your team for tomorrow, but it's the cover sheet, which is basically who was there, the, the weather, okay, and where, what, what route you're doing or what team you're on. This is the overall species list on route. Now, if you do an eBird list instead, you don't have to fill this out. You can just share those eBird lists with me, and I have um, directions on the folder on what username to share your eBird list or trip report with. Uh, let's see here. And then we have this long spur data sheet. So this is anytime you find long spurs. Okay. So you're going to put the, the location, the coordinates, the time, a number, whether you check if that's estimated or not, the distance and direction. If you're right on top of them, then it's just like, you know, zero meters right here. But sometimes you see them at a distance. You're like, oh, 50 meters to the Northeast. That's, that's what we're asking for there. Um, and whether layman's love grass is present in that location. And then if you, uh, if you identify any other grasses in the area, 
and then where they add a tanker pond and then notes. That's it. So that's all we need filled out on our Longspur occurrence form. So it's it's not too much, but it really helps us look at these trends over time to see where the long spurs are occurring. We do map this data. So at the end of the survey, everyone will receive um, the updated map showing where all the long spurs were, which is really fun. And it's really interesting to look at those maps over time. So that's why we do it like that. And here's the cattle pond assessment. Um, I will tell you specifically which cattle ponds that I need an assessment from for your team, but it's just the location or the name. If it's a name tank, you can just put the name percent of water that's muddy edge. The protocol talks about this a lot. What I mean by muddy edge, but basically is it a, is it a dirt edge or is it like a grassy bank where there's no um, nice mud edge? And the reason we ask that is it does seem like muddy edges are really important for the long spurs. The slope, so how steep the edges are of the, of the tank, and then whether there's vegetation. So is there grasses or trees or shrubs within three feet of the tank? And within 50 feet and just how much is it none slight moderate or thick and then an area for notes so it's not not a huge amount it's asking for and then here's the transect data form for your 200 meter transect you will do a new form for each transect so you'll fill out at least four of these if you can go more than a page if you need but um they tend to have been fitting on one page so you're going to do the name of the transect the date location and then as you encounter species as you walk your transect this is where they'll go whether they're audio visual or both the total count the distance zone, so that's how far away they are from the line, that center line you're walking, uh, was it within zero to 50 meters, which is pretty big. So most small birds you encounter are going to be definitely within 50 meters, whether they're further away, 50 to 100, or even very, very distant of 100 to 150. And if you can tell, which is not likely in the winter, but if you can, whether they're male, female, juvenile, whether there's any breeding behavior, again, not likely in the winter, but if, you, if they are singing or something, that's where you would record that. So it's kind of a species list, whether they were audio, visual, or both, the count and have the distance from that center line, which again, the protocol talks about at length. Um, and then of course that tank watch form, which only tank watch teams will be using that, um, I also showed it's a tank watch form. All right, so the last thing I wanted to cover, um, Kind of at you, sorry, and then we'll then we'll take questions. Is uh, long spurs themselves? How to tell long spurs? So I do cover this in the protocol to an extent, and it's pretty important to know, and it's really helpful, and it takes out a lot of sort of frustration for you guys, the surveyors, if you really know the call of long spurs, because they have this really, they have two distinctive things that they do: chestnut collar long spurs. They do move in a pretty distinctive way and they also sit still in a distinctive way but then their their voices are really pretty darn helpful as well so long spurs do this thing where they fly it always gives me the notion that it reminds me of like a, a popcorn popper the popping so they move as a group in this really interesting way of flying where they don't fly like a school of fish which is something that like horn larks will do where they fly in this really sort of uh, they have their slot in the in the group and they fly in that slot. Long spurs do this thing where they, they tumble around. They're tumbling over each other. They're switching slots as they move. And it's very visually interesting. And I can it, I, I would guess this is some sort of predator avoidance. So they're not really flying in a straight line. They're tumbling around each other. And it turns out what's causing this it, is this here. The fact that these three birds in the same moment have their wings at different um, locations. Some are have Some have them in, some have them out, and some have them part of the way. So that means they're sort of tumbling around each other. And it's a really, it's a really interest, it's a really distinctive flight pattern once you've seen it. it it's, it's very visually interesting and they call a lot when they fly. They also do this thing where they'll hang out on the ground. These are not birds that usually sit on fence lines or in trees. I have seen them sit on fence lines and it always throws me for a loop. They do do it sometimes, but they tend to sit more on the ground. Chestnut collar long spurs are not sparrows. They're in this, different family and they're more closely related to birds like snow buntings so they have this really interesting ground behavior of sitting on the ground kind of like what you imagine snow buntings doing and it's very similar with these long spurs they they tend to shelter on the ground and it's amazing you'll see a flock of them flying near a tank or something and they'll all sort of settle on the ground and the grasses and they're just gone they disappear into the grasses it's a very skillful thing they do but what that means is that sometimes you'll be walking around an area like doing a transect or something, and you don't realize that there's long spurs on the ground right in front of you. And then when you flush them, they all fly up calling. 
So they do tend to hang out on the ground. Not so much. I've never seen them in bushes or shrubs ever, but I have seen them occasionally on fence lines, but they're usually on the ground when they're not flying around. And if they find a tank they like with a lot of native grasses, they'll sometimes just hang out sitting on the ground near that tank. So when you're doing a tank assessment or a tank watch, you very well could see them sort of rise up out of the grass near the tank and come in to drink. And that's a really distinctive, almost snow bunting like behavior with them. Now their voices are key. Now I do have recordings of that on the website. So where I have all this sort of protocol information and I think, I don't think I did sound on this. So I'm gonna just reshare and do it with sound. Okay, share. Actually, just had sound as a default. Anyway, okay, so now the sounds will work. So uh, let's see here. So all right. Audio file of chest and cord long spurs. Okay. If you are not super familiar with long spur calls, I would highly suggest you listen to that several times. Even if you are familiar, I'd listen to it at least once again to remind yourself if you haven't heard them yet this winter, because it's it's a pretty distinctive like keetle 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 kind of call, um, and they do it a lot. Anytime they're flying or coming in to drink, they that flock calls a lot, which is the only reason we're able to try to find them with sound recorders is because they do call a lot. And I never really, I don't know if they call so much when they're sitting on the ground, but when they're, when they're moving around as a flock, they're constantly that contact call to each other. Now, the problem is that it sounds a little bit like horn lark, which can also be in near these tanks or, you know, abundant in both of these grassland areas. So horn lark sounds like this. It's similar in the sense that it's a two-part call. DD, DD kind of call. And it's also high pitched like long spurs. Now, once you've heard them both, I always get confused though. At the beginning of every winter, I'm like, what? But I've been out several times, so I think I have it now. But here's another horn lark. <laughs> So it's similar in the sense that it's got sort of a two-part did eat did eat did eat did eat. Now the long spurs call, and we're gonna listen to that again right now. Again, the long spur call seems to have a bit more harmonics in it. To me, it's got a little bit more of a harmonic sound. So I would definitely listen to that several times. It's pretty darn helpful. The 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 way they sound is so important for trying to to get a sense of uh of what's going on with them um i do have a video as well let me play this so this is a video i need to put some website this is a the video. anesthesiologist ah, was like looks like residency did a number on oh, you well, let's skip that okay Showing a lot of white, which they do. All right, so I will also make sure that video link gets shared with everybody. It is in the protocol. Um, that link is right there in the protocol, but it's it's pretty darn helpful. That video was taken by Matt Griffiths, who works here at Tucson Audubon, and it's basically showing this nice still photo of long spurs flying. But the way they move is tremendously helpful, and then you can even hear in that video really well that call. It sounds exactly like the recording link that's on the website. Okay, well, I'm going to stop share for a moment. And I know I've been, I've thrown a lot of information at you guys, but I thought it'd be good to do this as a video meeting uh, rather than, you know, ask everyone to just carefully read the entire protocol. I definitely would suggest you look at the protocol um, if you have not done these surveys before, but let's see, how do I unmute you all? Um, I don't know how to do that. So if you have a questions, uh, I'd be happy to take questions right now. So please, if you do, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. And do we have anything going on in the chat? There's so many more buttons. When Nothing I'm in the chat. Meeting. Nothing in the chat. Okay. Now, does anybody have any questions? I'm also going to make sure I share my cell phone number with the, the group. So if anyone needs to call me with questions, it's also totally fine. 
Jenny, Conrad here. Hi, Conrad. On the um, tank watch, are we better off in vehicle or out of vehicle? That is a really good question, Conrad. And I actually had not thought of that. Um, I always do them out of vehicle. Um, I think it's easier to hear and all that. But if it's getting really cold and you'd rather <laughs> watch for a while from inside the vehicle, that's that's fine. And using the, there's some good arguments for using the vehicle as a blind, actually. Uh, to not scare them so much because they are pretty skittish. You know, I, I tend to try not to stand right out in the open, uh, either near the vehicle or kind of near some other feature that might hide me. I think I, I'm fine with either, but let's maybe put a note on the form if you are in the vehicle. And in fact, I'll add that to the to the directions. Say if in vehicle or not. That's a really good question. I have no problem with people doing in vehicle. I think it'll work better. You'll hear them better. You'll see the lung spurs better not in the vehicle. But if it's super freezing, because one year we did this, that when we started, it was so cold and the ponds were frozen and the long spurs were coming and just sort of standing on the ice waiting for it to melt. If it's a morning like that and you'd rather watch from inside the vehicle, that is fine. Uh, it's just my observation that waterfowl are often far more skittish if I'm in a pedestrian than if I'm in my truck. That's a really good point, too, because of you know hunting. So, OK, so that's actually an interesting point. That might be a really good protocol is to sort of watch for a few minutes from inside the vehicle before getting out yeah that's that's a good that's a good thought Connor. thank you so i see here someone commented are there issues with access okay so access is one of those things in in lost in these tanks that we go to a lot that we've been to a lot access is not a problem which is why we've been to them a lot now um judy i'll get to your question in a moment thank you so in las cienegas that is mostly public land Everywhere we're going, except for some exceptions on the Curly Horse Road team. And that team leader knows that area very well. Most of this area is BLM, is Bureau of Land Management, you know, public land. So that there's are some issues with grazing leases and things. And, and, and it's not exist. La Cienegas has this ranching heritage that is still very strong in Las Cienegas, but access is very, very good in Las Cienegas. There's, if there are fences, they're not going to be locked. They're just there to keep the cows in certain areas, and you can sort of open them like Texas gate style. Um, San Rafael is trickier. Most of San Rafael is private land, but the areas I send people are areas that you can get to. There's a lot of good areas and tanks that we don't get to in San Rafael because of access problems. So those are not areas I'm going to send people. So I, we send people to areas where we've never had issues with access in the past. Now, if there is an issue when you're out there, if you get out there and suddenly there's a new gate or something, which does happen every now and then, you're just going to go ahead and document that and we'll make those adjustments for the next year. But but access should be pretty good. And these are areas we have done every single winter for the last 12 years. So we have, a, I, I only send people areas that they sh you should be able to get to. All right, so we have um, a question about where we're meeting and when. So that's great to review that again right here at the end. Um, so for the Las Cienegas survey on Wednesday, tomorrow, we will be meeting at 7.30 in the morning at the Empire Ranch House on the north end of Las Cienegas. So that, and I did email everybody up who signed up for the Wednesday survey, um, a Google pin on that, but it's pretty easy to find. It does have a pretty large parking lot and it does have um, sort of forest service style, no water restrooms. And then for the Friday survey for San Rafael, we'll be meeting at 7 a.m at the Gathering Grounds Cafe in Patagonia, which does have um, restrooms as well. And there's also there's a restroom in, in Gathering Grounds, but there's also two rest, you know, more restroom facilities on the south end of the park if you want to hit those on your way in. Those, those are usually open. Uh, there is a question too about carpooling. I was really not sure what to do about this. And I'm, I think I'm going to leave it up to people who are interested. If you are interested in carpooling, maybe let me know, email me, and I will send out a group email to everyone interested because I... It really depends on what people, how everyone's feeling now about whether they want to carpool. We haven't really been doing it much the last uh, several years for obvious reasons, but if people are feeling more comfortable, like they want to carpool from Tucson, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll connect everyone who's interested in that to see, see how that could work. When we're out doing the surveys, some people indicated they were comfortable carpooling and, and I, I'll make a note on, on each team for that. Some people said they'd rather caravan. And that's totally fine. There's no reason you can't care about, especially with the tank watch surveys, just go from sort of, because you're spending so much time at a tank, drive the two cars to the tank, get out, 
do the thing, get back in your cars and go to the next thing. So um, caravanning is totally fine if that's what makes people comfortable. We can leave cars at Las Cienegas. So if you'd rather meet, or excuse me, at Empire Ranch in Las Cienegas, if you'd rather meet there and then hop in someone's vehicle just for the morning, like with the windows down type thing, and then get back in your own car to go back to back home, that's totally fine. There's plenty of parking there. There's a lot of parking outside of gathering grounds as well for, for the Friday survey. So whatever people are um, comfortable with is is what I want to do. So if you if you really want a carpool, I know a few people already are who know each other, but if you're interested in trying to find a carpool friend, email me and I'll, I'll email that whole group. So I also have a note here from about the tanks. Some tanks require a short walk. That is true. There's a few of these tanks you can drive right up to and use your car as a blind. There's some that you really can't as well. Now you still may be able to, from standing outside the car at a distance, see if there's ducks or anything before you head over to the tank uh, to try to get some of those species before they flush. So you can still maybe kind of use your car as a shield to try to get some of the, get your sort of your species diversity <laughs> at the tank. But um, that is true. Some of them you can't really so much park at, you have to sort of walk over to them. That's certainly a very good point. So that's why I'm just going to make that just totally optional. It depends on your preference and depends on the situation of the tank. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions about these surveys or where to find the resources we've talked about? Jenny, can you hear me? I sure can. I'm just wondering when we will know which type of team we're on or if we know You're our team. You're signed up for yet. Friday, is that right? No, I'm signed up for tomorrow. Okay, I do have that up. So let's see here. Let me. Oh, okay. Which tab am I looking at here? Okay. Um, so I have you. Um, I have you doing a transect team, and you're actually with me. Okay, excellent. So we're gonna do it's it's you, me, John, Rulin, and Karen Howe, and then Carolina, and we're gonna be doing the the northern routes. So we'll be doing some transects as well as a few tank assessments. And that north end, I'm putting two routes together up there because. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't be biased like this, but the first route never has anything. So anyway, we'll be doing both, but it's, I hate to send a team out there to do a whole section that hardly ever had long screws on it. So um, thank you. Thank you'll you. See, you'll see how much layman's love grass is on that North end of the, of the La Cienegas. It's covered in layman's. Um, so that's what's going on there. But yeah, so I did um, send out an email link with the, the teams for La Cienegas. I'm still working on San Rafael. I will try to get those done today. Um, so that everybody knows what's going on for Friday. So I will be sending a follow-up email uh, once I get this video from this meeting online. Um, I'll send a link to the to it being on the Two Snowbound YouTube channel, as well as the link again to the the Teams document, and then um, like the protocol and all that. And really, the I think one of the most important things, one of the most helpful things, is to listen to those long spur calls. Maybe watch that long spur video again. It's very, very helpful. It's I cannot emphasize enough how much easier and how much more confident I felt identifying chestnut colored long spurs once I had the call down. And another thing to keep in mind is that if something goes wrong, if if you can't get to one of your transects, if anything, if you realize you're in the wrong spot, don't stress too much about it. That's why we do these twice every winter is to make sure we get everything we need. I don't want people doing something that's dangerous or whatever to try to get a you know some data it's i want everyone to be my top priority is everyone being safe everyone having um, a nice morning and finding the birds we find recording the the data of what, what's out there so the weather looks good for both wednesday and friday it's going to be awfully cold to start but it should warm up um i think it's a nearly 60 by 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 like midday so it should be pretty warm out there wednesday and even warmer on friday so I think it'll be good. Um, and if you have any issues with your team assignment, let me know. But um, I was able to accommodate people's preferences. So I think this should be good. And um, if you're part of the Friday crew, uh, watch out for those team assignments later today or, or possibly tomorrow. But I'll be yeah. getting that soon. Yeah. Yeah. Will the um, KML or KMZ files be on that uh, email or announcement? Yes. So I okay. did send that out for the Las Cienegas crew, the survey tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll send the Friday one out probably to the San Rafael KML out for probably send it out tomorrow. Cause I want to make sure I have all the, my new names of the tanks and stuff updated before I download the KML. But yes, I will be sending that out to all participants because sometimes that's helpful for people to load onto their Garmin units or, or, you know, into some other device. So yes, Conrad, I will make those available. Okay, so I will have data forms for everybody. And if you're on the Los Cienegas crew, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 7.30 at Empire Ranch. And um, if you are on the Friday team, I'll see you 
at seven o'clock at Gathering Grounds in Patagonia. So I have a question here about our spots taken. It is pretty full. These surveys are pretty pretty packed. Now, if anyone, I could always add maybe one more person to a tank team. So if anyone has someone who de desperately wants to come along, um, let me know. But I really can't add too many more people. These are, these are pretty packed. Because I, I pretty much put all the wait list in too. Uh, what the wait list was as of a few days ago so it's they're pretty packed but yeah i could probably squeeze in another person if if someone desperately wants to bring somebody jenny you were gonna give us your uh, phone number your cell number yeah i should certainly Not tell you that now and then i'll also uh put it in oh, the okay. email but it's it's 520-360-2213 okay all right, I really am so pleased to see so many sort of uh, people who haven't done these surveys before on this survey. They're a lot of fun. The grassland habitat is absolutely beautiful. And long spurs, chestnut colored long spurs are one of the fastest declining bird species in North America. They're tremendously imperiled and due to what seems to be mostly habitat loss, their populations are absolutely just crashing. So that's the reason we spend so much time trying to do these surveys every single winter since we do have some of their wintering habitat here in Southeast Arizona. And both these areas we go to are global important bird areas for chestnut collared longspur. So these are really important surveys. Um, and the fact we've done chestnut collared longspur surveys in general since 2010 is really helpful and significant. And we've done this new protocol now three winters in a row, uh, this more sort of advanced protocol. So we're, we're getting a lot of data over, over the years and so I really appreciate you guys' help making this data happen again for, for winter 2023. All right. So I'll be sending out those emails real soon. And uh, thank you all so much. Oh, my gosh. Almost exactly an hour. Yes. All right. So I appreciate all of you joining me for this meeting. And we will be doing this again for the February survey. So you don't have to try to remember all this for a month. But um, we will be doing this again. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. And uh, I'll see you out in the, in the grasslands. Thank you, Jenny.